Good morning. Praise the Lord. There's a spirit of excitement in here today, and I'm just excited to be where God would have us to be. Amen? Amen. Well, just as my husband was singing that song, I want us, the goal today is for everyone before you leave today, you feel that Jesus really cares for you. We're going to get started. Uh, first of all, I want you to lift up your Bibles, and we're going to have our confession. Lift up your Bibles, whether you have it on your phone, and just repeat after me. This is my Bible, God's holy word. I believe it, and I receive it. Therefore, my life is filled with purpose. That is, to make God clear and visible to the world. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, our scripture text today will be found in Luke chapter 7. We're going to start with verse 36. Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 36. And it reads, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee, which had bitten him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be used by you. Holy Spirit, have your way. I decrease in order that you might increase in my life. Use me as an instrument in your hand. Speak through me the mysteries of your word. I pray that everything that is said and done today will give you glory and you honor. We thank you that we receive the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, the title of my message today is... Are you ready? Guess who's coming to dinner? Guess who's coming to dinner? You know, in the year 1967, this was a time of bitter racial tensions. And this classical movie titled, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, starring Sidney Poitier, Spencer Tracy, and Katherine Hepburn, hit the box office by storm. The movie centered around an unsuspected guest, played by Sidney Poitier, being invited to a special dinner. Well, in our story today, and in the dance that I just demonstrated, we again find a time of bitter tension. But this time, the tension is between the religious leaders and Jesus. Jesus had accepted an invitation to attend a dinner that was given by Simon the Pharisee. So let's look at what happened at this particular dinner. Well, it had been over a year that Jesus had started his ministry. And he, had, he was preaching in the area of Galilee. And many of the common people received him openly because they'd seen him firsthand or they'd witnessed the miracles that he had performed. They'd seen people, uh, him raise the dead uh, cast out demons. They saw him healing a leper and a paralytic man and uh, dozens of other people th that he healed. He had cast out demons. He had uh, raised the widow's son from the dead, and he even associated with sinners. Now, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they didn't like Jesus. They didn't like what he was doing, so they tried in many ways to destroy his ministry. Now, I want to stop and say this. There are a lot of people that see you every day. They see you pray before you eat your meals. 
they see how you always give God praise and glory when things are going bad. They don't like you. And they will try everything they can to destroy what Jesus has done inside of you. So think it not strange when these things happen because it happened to Jesus, so it's going to happen to you. Well, these Pharisees, they just did not like what Jesus was doing. He's loving the people. He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons. But he's doing it to all people, heathens as well as Jews. And they didn't like that. So the Pharisees were, these were Jewish religious leaders. They called themselves the separated ones. They were a small, extremely influential group of people. Now, the Pharisees believed the entire Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. They believed all of the Old Testament. They also uh, believed in the, uh, all of the uh, rituals of the church. They believed in tithing and all the ceremonial uh, washings. And they just added, added to the Old Testament because that's what they wanted to do. Now, the Pharisees were in charge of the synagogues. Now, the synagogues were like what we call little churches. And anytime a family of 10 or more got together and they wanted to worship and pray together, they would start a synagogue. So the Pharisees would be the leaders over these little synagogues. Now, the other religious leaders that didn't like Jesus were called the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees called themselves the righteous ones. They were Jews, and, but they only believed the first five books of the Bible. Uh, just the first five books of the Bible. They didn't believe anything about the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe anything beyond the first five books of the Bible. But they were the wealthy, aristocratic people. They were over the uh, temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where this temple was, and all of the people would come from all over the region to worship at the temple. And so the, Fer the Sadducees were in charge of the temple. There were also the scribes, and the scribes were the ones that would write, write the scriptures on the scrolls, or they were also considered lawyers. And then there were the Herodians. They, too, were opponents of Jesus, and they just believed uh, in uh, Herod being king of the Jews. They didn't like the fact that here come this Jesus saying he was king of the Jews. Well, they felt like Herod was the only king of the Jews. So all of these four the Sadducees, Pharisees, the Herodians, and the scribes, they hated each other, but they joined forces to go against Jesus. Isn't it amazing how that works? So our text tells us that this Pharisee, Simon, invited Jesus to his house for a dinner. Now his motives was um, he was going to snub Jesus. He was going to show Jesus you know, that you're not welcome here. And so he invited Jesus to this dinner. Now, many of you may have been invited to special events. And I want you to understand, Jesus only did what his father told him to do. So Jesus went to the dinner. Obviously, his father wanted him to go because there's purpose. When you get an invitation to an event, you may not like the event. You may not like the people. But you need to pray to God, and when you get peace, go, because God may have an assignment for you at that event. And so this is what happened. There was an assignment for Jesus at this event. He knew the motives of, of Simon. He knew Simon didn't like him, but let's look at what happened. Now, when you read the Bible, you've got to read it in the context of culture. You've got to understand what the culture was all about in those days. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about the culture, and this scripture is going to make a whole lot more sense. Well, this woman who, as Simon was saying, if, if this man were really a prophet, he would have known that this woman was a sinner. Well, this woman who was a sinner wanted to come to Jesus. Obviously, she had had an encounter with Jesus at some point. And she just wanted to bring him a gift. You know how sometimes you just want to show your gratitude to, to somebody and you just want to give them something. See, that's an outpour of, of the Holy Spirit inside of you wanting to show your appreciation. 
And so she wanted to show her appreciation to Jesus, but she knew she wasn't allowed to go to uh, a, a, an event like this. So during those days, the Jewish culture was one of the most male-dominant cultures in the world. The men had authority over his wife and his daughters, establishing their activities and their relationships. Women were passed from the control of her father to the control of her husband with little or no say in the matter. This is the culture this woman was coming out of. That's why there's a lot of arranged marriages. There were arranged marriages in those days, and they still exist today. The women were sold for a dowry settlement, usually when they came of age. Most women in the Bible got married as soon as they were physically ready, they started their cycle, and they were able to bear children, which was starting at age 12. Now, the men in biblical times usually got married a little older. They started generally at about 14. As you will recall, in Genesis chapter 24, when Abraham, uh, Abraham was married to Sarah, Sarah died, and they had this son, Isaac. And Isaac was just moping around. And Abraham said, mm, it's time for this joker to get married. He got to get up out of here. So he decided it was time for Isaac to get married. And so he told his uh, servant, Eleazar, he summons him and he said, Eleazar, I need you to go back to Mesopotamia, to my homeland, and I need you to find a bride for Isaac. I don't want him to marry one of these Canaanites. They were heathens. And Abraham, Abraham is the, the father of promise. Uh, he, all, we all are descendants of Abraham. That's who God made the covenant with. So it was very important that Abraham got this right. So Abraham told Eleazar, go to Mesopotamia, find a bride from my household to marry Isaac. And Eleazar was a bit, you know, confused. He said, look, well, what if she doesn't come? And Abraham said, if she doesn't come, then that, that, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Just go and find someone. So Eleazar leaves. He goes to Mesopotamia. And he brings with him, because he has to bring a dowry, he brings with him gold and silver and, and fine linens and jewelry and you name it. And he goes to Mesopotamia and he comes to the place where they were watering the camel. And he runs into Rebecca. And Rebecca was from Abraham's household. And so Rebecca invited him home. And there her brother Laban, and that's a whole other story. I won't get into Laban. But brother Laban and her mother was there. And Eleazar explained the situation. And guess what? Rebecca decided, after she saw all of this jewelry, she decided she's going to go marry uh, Isaac, sight unseen. So Eleazar gave the precious gifts to Rebecca and to uh, her mother, and she returned uh, and she married uh, Isaac. Now, a diary had to be given because of the work of the woman. When she left and got married, the household would lose a servant. And so the diary made up for the loss of the funds. And so this is why when Mary and Joseph were engaged, um, a diary had to have been given, and they were just as married. Once that diary is given, whether you're living together or yet or not, because Joseph had to uh, find a housing arrangement, and so it took a while, but as long as that diary was given, you are married to that person. And so back in those days, women did not have the right to divorce. Women could not play a significant role in the synagogue. Remember, the synagogues were like little churches. They couldn't play significant roles in the synagogue because they were Levitically unclean for several uh, days of the month during their menstrual cycles. So men looked at them as unclean. Now, women were allowed to receive very little education on religion, and the main religious instructions in the home was given by the man and not the woman. Women were not allowed to let their hair down in public. As you notice in the dance, the woman was considered a sinner and because her hair was down. Women were not allowed to let their hair down in public. This was to, it was to remain pinned up or covered 
letting their hair down in public was like a woman taking off her blouse today. Women could not be discipled by any great rabbi and certainly could not travel with any rabbi. So this, that, this is what the culture was for this particular woman. Now, all of a sudden, here comes Jesus on the scene. His teaching must have seemed very radical. He did not show partiality, and he showed love. Remember, Jesus came to teach us how to live in the kingdom. He preached the message of the kingdom, which was, he, he came not to do away with the law, the Old Testament, but to fulfill the law. This is the way it was in the Old Testament. But Jesus came to show us a new way. And this is what he was doing. He, uh, he didn't just heal and deliver men. He included women, boys, and girls. In fact, many women followed Jesus, including prostitutes. One of the first people Jesus healed was Peter's mother-in-law. That's found in Mark chapter 1, verse 30. He also healed the woman with the issue of blood. Now, this woman had been hemorrhaging for 12 long years. She was considered unclean. And if she came out in public, she was supposed to say, unclean, unclean. But for 12 years, this lady was hemorrhaging. She went to every doctor. She gave up all the money that she had, and she was desperate. But she had heard about Jesus. She heard that he had healed the sick. She heard he, cast, uh, he raised the dead. And so she had to get to Jesus. And so she uh, overlooked all of the, the protocol back in those days. And she said, I've got to get to Jesus. And she got through the crowd, and she said, if I could just touch, this is faith, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. It wasn't necessarily his hem, but it was a prayer shawl and the tassels that were hanging from the, she said, if I could just touch that, I don't need him to speak to me. I don't need him. I just, by faith, I just need to touch him. You know, that's where we need to get sometimes. We get desperate. There are a lot of situations going on in this world today. And we wonder, we scratch our heads and we say, Lord, what's going on? Well, you can't control it. You can't change anything, but you can pray. You can pray. You can use the faith. The Bible says God has dealt uh, the measure of faith. Every man has faith. But you've got to take your faith and use it and trust God. And this is what she did. She got a breakthrough. She got a healing. She pressed through the crowd. She touched Jesus. And Jesus knew virtue had come out of him. And he said, who touched me? Well, his disciples said, Master, all these people, we don't know. And Jesus said, no. You see, see Jesus felt faith. He, he felt, and he feels it from you when you pray. He feels that faith, and he, and he will act upon the faith. And so he um, healed the lady, and he also healed, uh, he raised a woman in Nain's uh, son from, from dead. He healed a Syrophoenician woman's daughter, and when Mary and Martha pleaded with him, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus was an equal opportunity healer and deliverer. If we were going under the Old Testament and only men got the favor, she never would have gotten healed. But Jesus came to teach something different, that I'm here for everybody, not just for men, but I'm here for everybody. So on his journey to Galilee, he was leaving Jerusalem and he was going to Galilee. All of a sudden, he had this urgent, urgent need to pass through Samaria. The Bible says, it says, I must needs go to Samaria. Now, Samaria was a town that the Jewish people didn't want to go through. They would go all out of their way not to go through the shortcut of Samaria. Samaria was a town that where uh, Jews had married Gentiles. They were called half-breeds. And the Jewish people didn't want to go and be around those half-breeds. So they would go all the way around but Jesus felt an urgency. See, he's cutting through all of the, the, the um, stereotypes from the past. He's cutting through all of that. And he goes directly into Samaria, which was, again, he was a Jew. And Jews were not supposed to do that. But see, you can't tell Jews, Jesus what to do. And so he meets the woman at the well because he was on assignment. He had to be there to meet that woman at the well. That woman... Uh, you know, she tried to hide who she was, but Jesus said, he's a prophet. Jesus said, well, 
uh, you know, yeah, you've been married five times, and the man you're living with is not, you're not married to. And she knew that only a supernatural could tell, could, would know that about her. And so he uh, ended up healing this woman, and she ran into her town and said, come see a man who told me all about myself. You see, when Jesus does something for you, it is our responsibility to go and tell what good things God has done in our lives. Jesus also ministered to the woman who was caught in adultery. Now, how you catch somebody in adultery if you ain't there watching? So this woman was caught in adultery. And here's the thing. These men who caught her in adultery brought the woman to Jesus and said, Jesus, she should be stoned. Why isn't the man that was with her also being stoned? They didn't look at it that way. This woman needed to be stoned. And Jesus, see, if it was an Old Testament, they would have stoned her. But Jesus came to teach something different. Jesus said to these hypocrites, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And so they had to reevaluate their lives. And as Jesus started writing in the sand, he probably was writing their sin and who they were with. I don't know what he wrote. All I know is they dropped their stone and went the other way. So Jesus came to teach us how to live in the kingdom. The kingdom was totally different from the old traditions. So let's talk about culture. Jesus was invited to a dinner. So what happens at a dinner? Well, it's not like the dinners we have today. Back in those days, you only invited people to a meal uh, as uh, an aspect of friendship. To eat a meal with someone was to be at peace with them. Now, we know the Pharisee, Simon, was not at peace with Jesus. He didn't even like Jesus, but he invited him. But when you're invited to a meal, you're inviting someone that's a friend. And generally during those times, at a meal, at, a, at an invitation, the host would usually sit at the head, um, and I'll talk about how they, they sat in those days, but the host would generally sit at the head, and then the most honored guest would sit to his right. The next honored guest would sit to his left. And so... Jesus, who was invited, was supposed to be the honored guest. It didn't happen, and we'll explain that in a few moments. But normally, when you're inviting somebody over, the most honored guest would sit to the right, and the next would, be, would sit to the left. And they, would, uh, they uh, had a meal in a reclined position. They didn't sit at tables. I don't care what Lord's Supper picture you've seen with tables, that's not how they sat back in those days. So they sat kind of in a square. Let me use Brother um, uh, Deacon Antonio. Now you're going to, give me, you're going to lay right here. Lay, lay, lay. No, 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 no. Just turn around. Turn around. Head to them. So in, if you were invited, you're not going to sleep. You're going to put your, you're going to put your left, left arm, left arm on the pillow cushion. There you go. This is how they reclined. And what would happen is they would, it would be raised up and the, the food would be on the table right in front of him. And so with his uh, right arm, he would be able to reach and get the food. And so the slaves or the, the women would prepare the food. And so in, in verse 38, it said that the woman stood behind him at his feet. This is how the woman was able to be at his feet because they were in a reclined position. So this is how uh, they would eat. And so on the, at the Last Supper, when Jesus had the Last Supper before he died, the most honored guest at that time was Judas, the one that betrayed Jesus. He was to Jesus' right, and John was to his left. And so he was considered, Jesus knew he was going to betray him, but he, Jesus still honored him by making him the honored guest. So they would start off with um, drinks uh, of honey, uh, then they would uh, eat the food, and so they ate with their fingers. 
except for soups and eggs and shellfish, which uh, were included. And in, in that case, they used spoons. There were no such things as forks back in those days. Now, the most honored guests would be given a token meal by the host. This is what Jesus did with Judas. That's a piece of bread. It was dipped into the food and was used as a spoon, the bread spoon. And co the contents were put into the mouth of the favorite guest. So the host would actually feed the favorite guest on his right and on his left. And that's what Jesus did with Judas, providing a, a final loving appeal to him. Someone that was about to betray him, Jesus still showed love. Now, uh, the next, the, now, so when you go to a person's house, okay, um, brother, I need you to stand up. And if you'll stand right there, just stand right there. Thank you. No, go down on the, down, down, right there. Okay, now, I am going to get Brother Leonard. So when you went to a, a guest home at, at that time, the first thing, the first thing that, that a guest would receive when they got to a home was a, a formal kiss. Now, a greeting, th this kiss was a greeting, a greeting given by a friend. Now listen to what I'm about to say. It involved the laying on of hands on each other's shoulder. Then pulling together and giving a kiss, first on the right cheek and then on the left cheek. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what would have happened. Thank you. This is what, thank you, gentlemen. This is what would have happened. The first thing when you went into somebody's house that invited you to a meal, the first thing that Simon was supposed to do with Jesus would be to greet them with a kiss. Now, there's d d several kisses in the Bible. Uh, Paul talks about uh, to greet one another with a holy kiss. Also, kisses were used to serve as cere for ceremonial purposes, uh, indicating respect. Samuel kissed Saul when he anointed him. And then the kissing of hands, you know how sometimes you see people, they'll kiss the hands. The kissing of hands or feet of a superior was an act of submission of worship. This is why the woman kissed Jesus' feet an act of submission, an act, you, an act of worship. So when you go to someone's house, the first thing they're, gonna, they're supposed to do is greet you with a holy kiss. The next thing they're supposed to do is wash your feet. Now, back in those days, you're walking through the desert. It's hot. You're wearing sandals. When you got to the home, now, if it's just one or two guests, they'll wash the feet right at the door. Usually, this was done by a servant or by the women in the house. And so, but it was so many people, there were hundreds of people that showed up because the word got out that Jesus was going to be at Simon's house and everybody wanted to go and see what was going to happen. They wanted to see what was going to happen. So it was hundreds of people. Well, you can't wash hundreds of people's feet when they first walk in. So what would happen is the guests arriving would be greeted again and they probably took off his sandal and they probably all went into the banquet area where they were going to be seated. And the feet were uh, washed by, uh, as they were in that reclined position, they were able to wash the people's feet while they were sleep, I mean, while they were eating. And so, um, the, what the servant would do would pour the water over the feet. They would rub the feet with their hands, and then they dried them with a towel. And this was done as the people were eating. This is what happened on the Last Supper when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Jesus became a servant. He's the Messiah. He's he, he dying. He's about to die on the cross. But he humbled himself, and he washed his disciples' feet. Remember, he came to teach us how to live in the kingdom. So he was coming to teach all of these people with title, the pastors, the bishops, the elders, all of these people with title, how to humble themselves and become a servant and serve the people. This is what he was demonstrating at the Last Supper. And so when you went to a person's home, you're greeted with a kiss, your feet are washed, and then the last thing, the guest's head was anointed with oil. And this was a scented oil. It, it, it had spices. It was olive oil, but it had spices in it. 
it was very expensive oil that came from India. And um, one of the things, the lady that I demonstrated the dance in the alabaster box, she came with uh, alabaster. And this, when I went to Israel, I uh, purchased this because it reminded me of the woman with the alabaster box. This, it's not a box, it was really a jar. This is alabaster. It kind of looks like a kind of whitish, brownish, tannish. And this is an alabaster jar. And inside of it, there's the spikenard oil, oil that they use. Now this, back in those days, was worth a year's salary. So if today, by today's standard, let's say you make $70,000 a year, that is how much this would have been worth. That was the magnitude of what this woman did. She gave all she had, and she wanted to lavish someone who loved her, forgave her, not a sensual love, but she wanted to show her appreciation. How many of you would take 70000 whatever you make, and just dump it in the offering out of gratitude? That was the magnitude of what this woman was doing when she went to this dinner. So... Simon invited Jesus to a meal, and then he snubbed him. Jesus knew Simon's behavior was intended as an insult. He knew Simon's heart. That's why he chose to ignore Simon. There were hundreds of people outside the house, but this woman made up her mind that no one or nothing was going to keep her from getting to Jesus. This woman obviously had a previous encounter with Jesus. In her sinful state, she showed love and forgiveness and, tur and, and turned her life around just as he did with the, and Jesus turned her life around just as he did with the woman at the well. So can you imagine, the woman is standing around all these men. She knows she's not supposed to be here, but she's going to get to Jesus. And she watches how Simon snubs the person that she's there to honor. That's why she began to weep. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like that with the underdog. I can't stand people mistreating children. I can't stand just mistreatment. And sometimes I will just weep. So she saw somebody mistreating her Lord and Savior, and she began to weep. But as a woman, she couldn't do much other than uh, anoint him with this oil that she had. Jesus can handle insults against his own character. He's not about to put up with an arrogant attack on this woman's sorrow. With the precision of a surgeon, Jesus proceeds to cut Simon to his heart and reveal the hypocrisy that laid within. Could Simon have been jealous that the woman was not washing his feet? The woman is listening intently to what Jesus is saying to Simon. She stood at his feet, behind him weeping. She observed the disrespect toward Jesus by Simon. We're going to go to verse 40. Go to verse 40. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Now, this is Jesus speaking. Simon says, Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most, and he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman. Now, this is Jesus Turn to the woman, and he's speaking to Simon. This is what he says to the, as he's looking at the woman. Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered in thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs on her head. He's reminding him of culture. 
Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Back in those days, they would put the ointment on the forehead, and because it was hot, as the person perspired, the ointment would roll down their face and would get that musty smell that they had. It would give them a fresh fragrance. And so that was the purpose of putting this on. And Jesus is telling Simon, you didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman, since I've been here, she's anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, Remember, Simon said if he were a prophet, he would know she was a sinner. Well, Jesus is letting him know. I already know about this lady. Wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. He's saying it to the woman. Jesus is saying it to the woman. Your sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat, all of these other people that were sitting at the dinner, began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Jesus showed no partiality to men, even in the fact that he chose 12 male uh, apostles. In Christ, women are liberated to serve Jesus in an equal manner. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now listen to me. This is not a male bashing message. Please don't take it as that. I'm just wanting you to know what Jesus' intentions were when he came. This message is to show the great length this woman went through to show her love and respect to someone who treated her differently, someone who treated her special. We, the body of Christ, should do likewise. Go out of our way to treat God's people with the utmost of love and respect. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've been on, what jail they've been in, how much they've been drinking, we, the body of Christ, this is what Jesus did. He reached out to those that others would not reach out. Now, in closing, I know y'all were waiting. In closing, when people look at you, what do they see? Which character in this story do you portray? The Pharisee with ulterior motives? following man-made rules, showing no love, no grace, no mercy? Or do you represent the woman, a sinner, grateful for Jesus' love, forgiveness, and mercy? Jesus came to earth to demonstrate how the kingdom of God should operate. Jesus purposely attended this event to teach Simon as well as all the others in attendance, how to treat an invited dinner guest in the kingdom because you never know who's coming to dinner. My time is up. I thank you for yours. something today, didn't we? Amen. God bless you. So glad you're here. Every head bowed and every eye closed. What a powerful teaching today. Pastor Brenda, perhaps you're here today and you say, Pastor Kenny, I don't know Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. Your hand up. I want to pray for you. Lead you in a prayer. Anybody here like that today? Pastor Kenny, pray for me. I see you. God bless you. All over this building. This is your time. Pastor, I've been 
I've been running from God. I've been doing my own thing. It hadn't been working for me. Now I want to make a change. I want to make Jesus my change. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I know without you I'm lost. Can't save myself. Come into my heart. Forgive me for my sin. Make me a new creature. Devil, get out of my life. I serve you no longer. Jesus is now my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your name I pray. If you prayed that prayer for the first time and you really meant it, I want to say to you, welcome to the family of God. 